blog. Um, and kind of with that, I'll I'll pass it off to Andrew and let you let you kick it off. Hi everyone, can you hear me now? Just buzz us on the the questions if you can. Okay, great. Yeah, so appreciate you all taking the time today. I think we've scheduled for 45 minutes. Uh, we started a couple minutes late to give people time to log on. So if we finish early, we'd certainly be happy to give you that time back. I do want to encourage everyone, if you have questions, if you have comments, please raise your hand, um, participate with the questions and everything in the chat box as part of the, the go-to meeting. Would love to make this interactive because I can get pretty boring if I just drone on and on. So with that, we'll dive into the agenda for the day. So first, we wanted to talk about the sharing economy today. It's uh, obviously the big buzzword in, in the New York Times and Forbes and Wall Street Journal. People are always talking about it. So what are they talking about? Why are they talking about it? Secondly, we'll get into some of the specific trends we saw over the last 12 months. In 2015, what happened? And what does that mean for the industry and for each of us on this call today going forward? And then as we look forward at these implications, how can we all adjust our businesses and, and our approach to make sure that we benefit as much as possible from some of the, the positive trends and also minimize the, the downside risk from some of the negative trends we're seeing. So on the sharing economy, right, it's a hot new term, it's a hot new phrase, it's a hot new industry. Well, it's not all that new, right? It's something that we've been seeing for hundreds of years. You could pick virtually any date, but Reynolds United chose the state of 1624 when Louis XIII uh, had the hunting lodge in Versailles built as the first vacation home. And probably, you know, Moses may have had a vacation home a lot longer ago. But point being that though the sharing economy gets a lot of attention, as a phrase, this concept of having heavy assets that are not used the entire time and so are thus shared with other people has been around for a very, very long time. So then the question becomes, why then do we care about this sharing economy? If it was under a different name and a, and a different guise before and it's been around forever, why is it a big thing now? Well, namely because largely due to branding, it's gotten absolutely enormous over the past several years. So Euromonitor, I think, had estimated that the vacation rental space in 1999 globally was worth $40 billion. As of 2015, that had gotten up to $150 billion. And as we look forward, the entire sharing economy space is looking to exceed $300 billion by 2025. So it's growing rapidly and that growth is accelerating. The pie is growing, the opportunity is huge. So let's dive into some of the trends and the implications. So the first trend you probably all experienced and, and heard a lot about is that of regulation, increasing regulation. The idea of all these people in New York breaking the law in New York to rent out their homes. Well, yes, but what's often not mentioned is that that law came out, I think, in 2011. It, it's actually a pretty recent law, and this regulation is new, and it's a lot of times driven by vested interests trying to limit the growth of an industry that they see as a threat. And so you see it's getting increasingly contentious and I think just yesterday in Chicago a city council member proposed that a one strike and you go to jail proposal for short-term rentals. It's, it's not just fines anymore, you can spend time in jail for exercising your property rights. It's a pretty terrifying space. But it's not all bad news either. I mean, I, there are other jurisdictions that are saying, hey, there's real economic benefit to this. People who stay in vacation rentals as opposed to staying in a hotel, stay for longer, spend more money, contribute more to the economy. So maybe sensible regulation, regulation that can help the local economy and local government benefit as opposed to being harmed by this, 
is the approach. And so some places, uh, a lot of jurisdiction in Colorado are doing some sensible pieces of regulation and the business secretary in the United Kingdom has come out publicly and said, look, think Airbnb, think Uber, think this whole sharing economy space could be a boom to our economy and we really want to make sure that we understand it and we take advantage of it. So what is, given that it's increasingly contentious, given that locations that five years ago or less people thought, oh, this will never have a problem with regulation, are now starting to see some NIMBYs, the not in my backyard, locals or the city council members get vocal, what can and should you be doing? And really you, you need to think about regulation in three phases. The first is prior to the conversation even starting in your local area. What can you be doing before anybody else is talking about it? And this is where you really need to start your coalition building early and collecting data and making the case for why vacation rentals and short-term rentals are really a benefit to the local economy and the people who live there, keeping taxes and other parts lower as long as the regulation is sensible. The second phase is once the rumblings start appearing. So if you missed out on that first one and didn't get good regulation put in the first place, but you're now being responsive to some loud locals trying to, to limit people's property rights, then you need to start looking at some of the alternatives to still a coalition build, participate in city council meetings, make sure that the people that have an interest in being able to exercise property rights and, and fully utilize their own homes and, and properties the way they want to are able to do so. And then the third phase is unfortunately once poor regulation is passed, what, what are your options then? And fortunately at all these phases, there are a number re of resources at your disposal. The Probably the most well known nationally is the Short Term Rental Advocacy Center. And that's a, a website that has a lot of great resources for all three phases to really help people get ahead of these regulations and, and try to do the right thing. Another resource is HomeAway, one of the backers of the Short-Term Rental Advocacy Center. And, you know, Matt Curtis there, that's what he spends his whole time on. He is a board member of the Vacation Rental Managers Association and does a lot of advocacy for the space. And I can speak from personal experience. He's happy to get on the phone with you and answer questions and, and give you advice and try to help if there's a way that he thinks he can help. And then beyond that, the resources are really your own connections and your own story and what you're able to put together there. So look, it's not all good news, it's not all bad news, but it is a lot of news as you can see from the slide that there's a ton of regulation, a ton of discussion. How can you make sure that you get good regulation if there's gonna be regulation and there will. And that's the most important part. The next trend we've been seeing in this space, and I think we started off talking about the sharing economy, then I kept saying vacation rentals, and both are kind of a misnomer, right? Because it's not completely sharing since a lot of dollars change hands, and it's not completely vacation rentals because one of the biggest trends that we've been seeing is this growth of non-traditional vacation destinations for alternative accommodation. And this is an area that Airbnb really opened up initially saying, hey, people who live in New York and Chicago and Seattle and Boston, you may not be there all the time. Could you rent out these properties? These are markets that have very limited hotel supply, conferences come to town, other things, and the, the rates skyrocket. People may prefer to have a unique accommodation that's more enjoyable. How can we make that available to you? And really taking advantage of that trend, home aways now, investing and experiencing the whole city, their, their city's initiative. Uh, they launched in May, powered by GoGoBot, one of their investments. And so the big thing really being here, getting back to that, the pie is growing. So if we had traditional vacation destinations before, lakes, mountains, ski markets, beaches, well, now there are more markets that are available to you to really take advantage of this growth in the sharing economy if, if you choose to grow your business. Hey, 
Uh, real quick, Andrew, if you don't mind me stopping you there, we just had a question come in uh, related to short-term rentals in urban areas. Um, it, it says here, are people starting to see more success in cities on HomeAway? Traditionally, it's a space that Airbnb has dominated, uh, but I wanted to see if their managers are seeing success there. I want to know if you have any thoughts. Yeah, so what you really see are there two avenues that most travelers find their accommodation. Uh, a lot come through TripAdvisor, they like the reviews, and that's where FlipKey is the strongest and, and TripAdvisor vacation rentals. And then the other big one is Google. And Airbnb and HomeAway really are the ones dominating Google and getting high placement on the page, good AdWords placement, uh, and, and getting those click-throughs. The other channels that you're seeing do pretty well there are some of the meta search. This is like tripping all the rooms. You know, there are several in the past couple of months that came up. So we have this real proliferation of booking sites and basically the ones that have been focused in the cities to date, namely Airbnb, are trying to get more in the vacation spaces and making a concerted effort to do that. And the ones that have been more in the vacation spaces to date are trying to get more in the cities. Basically, the grass is always greener, right? Everybody wants to, to grow their business and do what they can there. Um, thank you for the question. So the, the next trend that we've seen is Back to this, yes, vacation rental is a misnomer because these alternative accommodations are increasingly being booked by business travelers. And this is for two main reasons. The first is the incorporation with corporate travel departments. So, for example, Uber two years ago was a, a tiny fraction of expensed business travel for ground transportation, and now is the majority of ground transportation booking. And Airbnb has done a very good job in the past basically 12 months partnering with corporate travel departments and their service providers to make Airbnb inventory available to business travelers. And they like doing that. And predominantly for two main reasons. One, the location and the uniqueness of these properties can be a lot better. I mean, in, say you're going to London, there are only so many places that have decent hotels, but if you want to be out in Battersea or you want to be out in another location, there might not really be many hotel options. And Airbnb or HomeAway, whatever the site may be, has some very local and unique inventory available to you. The other piece of this is this idea of, hey, we're working harder than ever. We're having to travel all the time for work. How can I take advantage of that to my own benefit? And this is where this leisure travel concept comes in, where people may have a meeting on a Thursday or Friday and decide to stay the weekend. And if they're gonna stay the weekend, they may bring their family. And it's a lot easier and more enjoyable with a family to stay in a place that has a kitchen, that may have more than one bedroom and really embed you in the city as opposed to putting you in some corporate park. And so that really is helping to grow the business demand for the, the alternative accommodation space. And so as Airbnb looks at how do we take advantage of corporate travel, of business travel? It's an enormous market. They actually have launched uh, a business-ready program where there's certain criteria that you must meet as a homeowner. You know, you have to have Wi-Fi. You have to have 24-hour access to the keys and things like that. Uh, and if you meet those, then you fall in the separate category for business-ready, and, and you open up an entirely new market, a new customer for this alternative accommodation, not just vacation rental, which on its own, business traveler spends $120 billion a year and accounts for 30% of hotel bookings already. So you start digging into that, the pie gets even bigger. So thinking about what are business travelers looking for, how does that overlap maybe with your existing inventory, existing properties and existing ways of managing them, and how can you start tapping in to this new source of demand for bookings and for rentals. And probably the, the trend, maybe along with the regulation that's gotten the most ink spread over the past year, has been that about consolidation. So it's not just consolidation, there's also convergence, but the big one in this alternative accommodation vacation rental space being 
Expedia's $4 billion, $3.9 billion acquisition of HomeAway. But that wasn't the only one, right? We heard about Hyatt pouring $40 million into One Fine Stay. We heard about Marriott buying Starwood Hotels, owner of W Hotels, Weston, the Sheraton, Four Points, uh, St. Regis for $12.2 billion. We heard about Swiss Hotel buying up um, or getting bought, sorry, by Accor uh, along with Fairmont and Raffles for nearly $3 billion. And so you're seeing a ton of money, absolute ton of money being poured in to getting the big companies that are already in this accommodation space even bigger. And there are a couple of things that are interesting here. One is that, yes, the big players are getting bigger than ever. But the other one is the numbers. So $4 billion sounds absolutely huge for HomeAway. $3 billion sounds enormous for Fairmont. $12.2 billion for Starwood. These are very large numbers, and yet they all just pale in comparison to Airbnb's latest public valuation or private valuation that they've let out publicly of $25.5 billion. So it shows really where investors see the future growth in this industry, and that is in this alternative accommodation space. Yeah, hey, Andrew, we, uh, we just had another question come in from uh, a manager out there, and they're asking particularly, you know, related to some of the stuff you're talking about, the Hyatt investing in one fine state. Do you think more hotels will continue to bleed into the vacation rental space? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've met with people, IHG and the Continental Hotel Group, before the Marriott merger with acquisition of Starwood was the biggest hotel company in the world. And their strategy group, multiple different members came up to me saying, I really think we missed a beat by not trying to buy Airbnb years ago. And I think this is the single biggest growth opportunity in this space. And we don't understand it well yet and we need to understand it better so they're going to look to pour money into it and these are enormous companies that have tremendous resources and are used to managing accommodations right they are used to checking people in at all hours of the day they're used to getting places clean they are not used to having to deal with properties and bedrooms spread all over a city They're spread all over the country because they have local operators that that work in a single building so they still have a lot to figure out to be able to do it well, but they have the deepest pockets in the world to be able to figure it out. So I, I think they have to justify their share price and they have to figure out where their next path to growth is. And we're, we're going to see that a lot more going forward. Great. So, I mean, these trends lead into what we can expect looking forward. And this basically builds off some of that consolidation and convergence piece that as these players get bigger, they flex their bigger muscles. And what we're starting to see is companies that previously had only charged one side of the booking uh, process are now charging both. Say, well, there's money on both sides of this equation. Let's start charging traveler fees. And that was probably the big announcement other than HomeAway's acquisition that came from HomeAway last year was that they were going to roll out more fees on the renter, on the guest. It, this is something Airbnb already did, and it's, it's something that we're increasingly going to see from across the industry, from TripAdvisor, from HomeAway, from Airbnb. There's money on the table, and so the big players saying, hey, you depend on us for bookings. We want to take more of that money and a bigger chunk of it. And so we're going to see more of that going forward. Um, sorry, the, the other piece on that is what are the implications for you as a manager with that? Because if a homo, if a guest says, look, I have $1,000 for the week to spend on accommodation, just because all of a sudden they have to pay an extra 5% fee doesn't mean that all of a sudden they're going to pay $1,050, right? Their budget is what their budget is. So where is that $50 going to come from? Someone is going to eat that. If they're still paying a total of 1000 but 50 of that's getting eaten up by these booking platforms and distribution platforms, then someone is going to have to, to pay the price. And so you could see margins get squeezed even more than they already have been over the past 10 years. Another big trend we've been seeing is mobile. And this, this isn't just, obviously, in the accommodation space. This is or the 
vacation rental space. This is across travel, and this is across really every industry on the globe. But in travel alone, there's 17,000 apps now in existence just for travel. Two-thirds of U.S. households have three or more devices. And the biggest user base is 18 to 34-year-olds, right? The future of travel, the people that are now making their money that are going to be traveling as they get older, are increasingly using mobile phones not just to book travel, but also as they're on their trip, they use it as a resource. And this has a few implications. I mean, one is for managers, it's actually a very good thing because these travelers are demanding constantly that you are on point, that you are ready to answer their questions, to, to be at their service. And as an RBO owner, it's, in, it's almost impossible to, to fulfill those demands, right? If you have a full-time job, if you're a neurosurgeon and that's how you afforded this home, you can't be on call 24 seven for your vacation home. And so this is a real opportunity as the demands for the hosts increase for the best professional managers with the best service to be able to really step in there and separate themselves from the pack. It also is an opportunity to get more involved uh, throughout the guest experience, right? For, for a long, long time, the manager or the host of the guest would check people in and check people out, and there was very little interaction during the stay. And that is something that not just HomeAway, but a lot of managers are now trying to address. You know, HomeAway a couple years ago acquired Glad to Have You. This past year acquired Dwellable. You can see them pushing into the mobile space, and a large part of that being to try to be involved and try to shape that on the ground guest experience. And so, Think about what your opportunities are there, leveraging maybe the mobile apps already available if you use one of these distribution platforms, or thinking how to make your own site mobile responsive or your own mobile app. Another big trend uh, that ties to these big companies exercising their prerogative to, to be enormous players and shape the, the industry is this push for instant booking. And this, again, could be a real boom for professional managers because it's, this is where you start to get a real tension. Because guests who are used to booking hotels, used to booking flights with big airlines, used to booking rental cars from Hertz and Avis, are used to being able to go to a single site, click a button, and then within seconds knowing they have a place to stay. Now, in the traditional distribution platforms, HomeAway has said, on average, the guest reaches out to 10 different properties and it takes them nine days to book that. And that does not meet the guest's expectations. And so these companies are now pushing saying, look, if 90 plus percent of the guests are gonna demand instant booking, we're gonna give it to them. Because for every one host, there are 100, there are 200, there are 300 potential guests out there and we're missing out on some of that revenue. And so, as they push for this into booking, it's a huge opportunity for managers to reacquire what used to be RBOs. So homeowners that worked with managers and said, forget this, I'm going to do the whole thing myself. I'm going to screen every renter. I'm going to do all the work. Well, now you can't screen the renters, right? You're going to online booking. You're going to instant booking. And if you're a manager that has good background checks and possible, it can be incredibly responsive and get that 24-hour response and confirm bookings, then you can open up markets that would not be open to uh, an individual owner. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. It also kind of shapes the hand of who the real customer of these big players are. Are they the managers? Are they the homeowners? Are they the guests? And because that is now playing out, um, we're starting to see increasing distrust of the major players. So these, these players are getting bigger than ever. They're starting to take a bigger cut of the pie than ever. They're starting to implement some changes that homeowners really do not like from best match to instant booking. Uh, people you know, have called in to us and said, hey, I've been on X site for eight years. And I've always been page one, always been page one. Something happened in the last few months. I haven't gotten any bookings. And my revenue is down 70%. And I can't, I'm now on page three, page four. I don't know what happened. And it's, 
it is a danger when you build your business on someone else's platform, right? There are Zynga and Farmville and all these companies that build on Facebook. When Facebook changed its rules, all of a sudden those businesses dried up pretty quickly. Uh, companies built on Google, Google can change its algorithm and does constantly every day. It makes it very, very difficult to stay ahead of the curve. And so is this another opportunity for professional management companies to play on some of this distrust and say, look, homeowner, you still want your property maintained and taken care of, and you want someone who cares about it as much as you, but you also want to maximize your income. You don't want to have to deal with all this stuff. Let us do it. This is our job. And it's a huge opportunity as the pie gets ever bigger for managers to really tap into some of these fears and concerns of the homeowners. So kind of to wrap it up and, and happy to answer any questions if there are any more, um, what we really see looking forward is we expect 2016 to be what we call the year of the customer. And this is twofold. One, this is actually when the big players show their hand at who their real customer is. Is it the manager? Is it the homeowner? Is it the guest? And the answer is the guest. That's where the real volume is. That's where there are thousands for every one of the other players. And that's where they're spending their money on marketing. That's why they're doing these big ads and commercials and, and marketing pushes to get in front of these guests because that's what's going to drive growth. The second piece of that is as they define that group as the, the customer, what do they do to fulfill that customer's wants and needs? And that, that is going to be where you're going to see a bigger push for instant booking, a bigger push for best match. How do we provide what those guests expect? And thus, for managers, 2016 is the year to grow. So there's been a lot of consolidation, and this is the time that you can start consolidating in the industry. This is the time that you can start taking uh, your business to the next level. 50% of the webinar respondents for today had said their single largest challenge, the one thing that they're most concerned about is growth. How do I grow my business? How do I get more homes? How do I get more properties? to manage. And there are a number of ways to do that, obviously. I mean, one that we already talked about in other parts of, of the space is mergers and acquisitions, right? So that could be a path to quick growth. You just go find a company that kind of fits with you, uh, maybe in an area that you're already in or a new area you want to expand to, you buy them. So it can be a, a very fast way to add a bunch of properties. But, and you know, there's been a lot of research on this from Harvard Business Review and other places, there's a very low likelihood of success, depending how you define that. Uh, a lot of research shows that 70 to 90% of mergers and acquisitions fail. So it's quick, but it could be a quick failure and is more likely to be a quick failure than to be uh, a quick success. And the other part is it, it can be high cost. So a lot of times management companies in these acquisitions, you have to purchase at a price that the owner of that company is willing to sell. And this is oftentimes this owner's baby. They may overvalue what it's really worth. So to be able to get it, you may have to overpay. And we've seen managers have to pay for up to $10,000 per contract that they end up acquiring. Another avenue is organic growth, right? This, this gives you the highest chance of success because you, by doing it one by one, by doing it under your contract, under your values, under your company's name, you know these owners fit with your approach to business. Uh, the, the difficult part on this is it's not very fast. You know, it, it's a slow but steady game. And again, because you need employees, you have to put time, you have to put resources, you have to put your own marketing dollars to it. It can be pretty costly. And so the, the third option, and this is where I have to do my own little rented pitch, is work with rented or, or other resources that can help you with acquisition. And the idea, again, behind rented is we're a marketplace that all we do is connect homeowners looking to work with managers with managers looking to grow. And so through these seven day auctions, these properties become available. It makes it very quick to find the properties you want and to start adding them on. And, and it's a very high chance of success because you only pay for success. 
If the homeowner doesn't like your offer, you never waste any time on it. Keeping your costs incredibly low, uh, what we see really is the lowest in the industry. But regardless of whether you decide that rent it is right for you uh, or not, we really, really do appreciate you taking the time and would love any comments that you have. So relax, it's rented. If you want to get in contact with us going forward, then um, you, know, you can reach out to us directly, phone number 404-421-6096, or you can call 1-844-RENTED-4, and these are all our social media handles and, and accounts. So are there any other questions? Yeah, we've, had, we've actually had quite a few come in. Um, let's see, let's just go through a few. Here's, here's one from Andrew. Andrew, do you think instant booking is going to drive more homeowners off the sites completely or towards using property managers? It's a good question. Uh, there's one thing, so they always say surveys are the lowest form of data, right? And when you speak to homeowners, a lot of times they say, hey, if they do X, if they require instant booking, if they don't let me personally speak to every single person before I confirm a booking, then I'm going to leave. I'm just never going to rent the space anymore. Now, what people say and what they do are two very different things. And so people may say that, and yet if they can't afford the home without the rental income, they may not have the financial means to, to live up to their threat. Yeah. And so certainly there have been plenty of people who threaten it. You see it on LinkedIn, you see it on Twitter, you see it on Facebook, you see it in all these different channels, homeowners very vocally uh, saying that. But that being said, I think it may play out differently. I think in reality, they're going to need the rental income. They're not going to want to do it themselves. And that's why it is such a big opportunity for managers to help them still maximize their income, but not be threatened by these changes in the industry. Great, great. Yeah, we got another one just uh, from someone in the industry overseas. Uh, the question is, Andrew, I read that professional property ma management segment is growing faster than the private owner segment. Is that something you've seen? Would you say that's true? That's certainly true. So, I mean, what you've seen is maybe 15, 20 years ago, the professionally managed segment, 80, 90% of the industry, right? It, it was the largest portion of properties rented because without the internet, without a lot of these distribution platforms, homeowners didn't have any other option. With VRBO, with HomeAway, with Airbnb, a lot of that shifted. And so you started seeing 60% of inventory was then being managed by homeowners, 40% by managers. But I think we're starting to see that tide shift. And it's starting to come back to managers where they're already accounting for over half of the rental income that's actually coming in. And that's only growing as homeowners who initially said, well, I can do this myself, it's easy, realize both, I, no, I can't do it myself, and it's incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. Great. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Here's another one came in a little earlier. If a property manager did want to grow organically, what are some of the best practices for recruiting new homeowners? Yeah, I, you really need to come up with what your unique value proposition is. Every manager is going to say, I'm going to take care of your home the best. I'm going to make you the most money. I have the best deal. That's not going to separate you because even if you sincerely believe all of those things are true, every other manager also sincerely believes that's true. So how are you really going to separate yourself from the pack? So that's, that's I can't tell you what your unique value proposition is. You don't have to be very good at everything, but be the best at something and really clearly articulate that. That's step one. Step two is make that clear from the beginning with your owners. So for example, with Rennet, right? There's certain owners, they would be terrible customers for us, right? They'll come in and say, yeah, I, I wanna do this, I wanna maximize income, but I wanna know every single guest that comes into my property. And we have to tell them, no, we're the wrong service. You can't come here because the whole premise of this is that you have no say in the gas anymore. It's the manager that gets to do that. And so as a manager, once you know what your spike is, once you know what your unique value proposition is, you also need, besides attracting the right people in, to filter out the wrong people. Because if you let in the wrong people who don't match with the value that you provide, 
you're going to end up with incredibly squeaky wheels that may end up costing you a lot more money than you make from them. And so it's really a twofold uh, approach there. Yeah, yeah. All right, here we got another good one over here. Uh, this, this one's kind of interesting. With the listing sites increasing fees, would you recommend pricing rentals differently according to what site they're on? This is, uh, I, I've seen this play out in different ways, right? So I, I've seen owners that very clearly price it differently. Um, Airbnb has one price, I'm away another, flip key another. And the savvy traveler looking at it said, hey, I can find your home on all three of these different sites and I see they have different prices. And some owners are completely transparent with stuff like that. They say, well, you know what? The reason I charge differently is because I have to pay different fees to these sites. So if you want the lowest price, you need to go to site X as opposed to Y. So if, if you know there's a certain amount you need to make and you want to be competitive, then absolutely I would take advantage of dynamic pricing um, to, to get as much money as a guest is willing to pay on each booking. Um. Let's see. All right, we got one more that just came through. Uh, it's just a general question about growing. You know, if as you've seen in the market out there, are there any types of contracts you would recommend that you're seeing are really resonating with homeowners? Out like, what are what are homeowners looking for contract wise? What's resonated with them? Yeah, and it, I mean the contracts. One thing, there are a number of different things a homeowner can look for, right? Some homeowners are much less price sensitive than others, and what they really, really care about is that you are going to completely take care of their home. So an example there would be something like Inspirato. So Inspirato, having looked at the numbers that come through our market, I can say almost every single time is going to pay the homeowner less than virtually any manager would make them. The homeowner is by definition making less. But what Inspirato does is two things. One, they invest a bunch of money into that asset. They show, look, I'm invested in this asset just like you financially. And two, they give them access to their travel network. So they give them this different value. And that's not right for every homeowner. Some homeowners need to maximize their money, some don't. Um, but that's, that's just being unique. Another way would be, look, if every single manager in your market is competing on commission, I'm gonna charge 20%, I'm gonna charge 15, it's a race to the bottom, right? And you're only gonna be able to make so much money. How can you offer something different? And this is where you know, we, we originally started with the fixed rent or the guaranteed rental contracts where we've seen that really resonate with homeowners. Wait, you're telling me, manager, that you're willing to guarantee me X, you know, $40,000 for the year? Then that's a great way to grow because that all of a sudden is a totally different value proposition that you're taking to that owner than anyone else in your market. Oh, and by the way, besides just adding the property, if you pay the right number, you have unlimited upside. So say... Every manager out there is doing 30000 on a property. And that's because everybody books the entire peak season, but only here and there are off-peak weeks booked because the manager is only getting a 30% commission or lower on each of those bookings, and they have a high marginal cost. But if on a fixed rent contract you're still paying the same amount, but you know, hey, for that property alone, I can cut my rate in half and still make money because I keep every single cent that comes in then all of a sudden you had to pay 30, but you doubled your profit on the home. And so it's, that's a, a very appealing way to, to grow for some managers. Some just aren't capitalized like that or, or don't want the financial risk or don't have great projections. So it really depends. I don't think there's any one silver bullet on contract approach or what your value proposition is. I think you need to look at your own circumstances, your own objectives and your own market. Yeah, yeah certainly. Yeah, this one, this one's kind of insightful here, and you know, it looks like I just want to get your thoughts on this. What are some of the trends within the professional property management space, specifically around the type of property manager business model? Really, the national brands versus the local focus, and then the on-site versus the models that manage, you know, from another place, from afar. Yeah, so I mean, I would I would separate those two out. So the local versus the national versus the international. In the long run, it's going to be the international, right? This is, this is where the consolidation, the convergence plays out. So in hotels, before the Marriott acquisition of Starwood, before two of the top five global players combined, there were six hotel chains in the world that accounted for 70% of global hotel rooms. 
that's now down to five, right? Five that account for over two thirds of all hotel rooms. And that didn't happen overnight, right? That, that took about 60 years to happen. But we're starting to see that in the vacation rental space. You know, the, the names are already known, but you see Hyatt and others investing in the space. We're gonna see convergence. The national ones are gonna win, but they have to have that local presence. On, look, it's hard to say for certain, but this need for a local presence versus doing it remotely, no doubt there are some companies and some homeowners that want that. I just find that that's a little bit splitting the baby, right? Either the homeowner wants to do it all themselves or they want to not think about it. So either I want full service management or I want to do it myself. This, I kind of want to do it myself, but I kind of want management. I think in, maybe there's a small market there, but I think the majority are going to push to the two extremes. Great. Yeah, um, you know, that's all the questions we've got here. Um, you know, I want to want to thank you for your time, Andrew, and, and really, you know, I appreciate all the, the managers and other industry experts who, who've joined us today. Uh, really provided a lot of great questions and, and, and really helped kind of continue this conversation. Um, you know, with that being said, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning uh, of the webinar, we're going to send out uh, to everybody uh, through email a copy of the deck. Um, where all, you'll get to see that and, and also be on the lookout. We'll, we'll be putting some posts up around this as well. So, so definitely, you know, check out the blog and, uh, you know, definitely stay in touch. We always love to hear uh, what you guys are seeing in the industry. Uh, appreciate it, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a great day.